welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. The Web Platform Podcast is a proud O'Reilly Media Partner. As such, one of the benefits we provide our listeners, that's you, are special discounts such as 50% off of ebooks and 40% off of printed materials. So this includes but is not limited to books on web technologies as well as other technologies you may be using. So your discount code is all caps PCBW. That's PCBW all in caps. So head over to O'Reilly.com. That's O-R-E-I-L-L-Y.com right now to get all your favorite tech books at much lower prices. This is episode 68 of the Web Platform Podcast. Welcome. On our panel today, we have Justin Ribeiro. Hello, wonderful people. Myself, Eric Isaacson. Hello, wonderful people. And we have some guests today talking about Ember. We have Robert and Andre. Could you guys please uh, just introduce yourselves, tell us what you do with the, with Ember um, if you work on the project? Uh, yeah, so. I'll, uh, I'll jump in. Um, uh, this is Robert Jackson. I am uh, RWJ Blue on Twitter and GitHub. I am an Ember core team member. I work... Uh, for a nice startup named Aptable. We make uh, generate, uh, uh, deploying healthcare apps and dealing with health, healthcare compliance in the US uh, very straightforward and uh, a happy path. So um, yeah, that's, a, that's what I do. And I'm Andrei Listvashkin. I'm a developer from Ukraine, from Kiev. And uh, I do consulting, consulting around Ember, and I also advocate Ember here at local conferences and meetups, and I also help organize some of them, like EOGS and others. Uh, I'm not working currently on Ember project, but uh, we have a very, very active Russian and Ukrainian speaking community in, on chats on Gitter, and I help there daily to uh, I help people who, who do Ember projects there. And, yeah, I love Ember. Now, this is our first episode about Ember. Uh, we tried to do uh, one earlier. We weren't able to do it. And it's been, like, over a year. So it's kind of, like, scary. We had a few on React. We had a few on Angular. Um, the community is not quite as as loud, I think, as Angular's community <laughs> or React. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. I've done some basic things with Ember. Nothing, nothing beyond, like, the starter templates or anything like that. But... It is interesting to me to see kind of what um, what everyone's using out there and why you would choose Ember over another framework and kind of what is that. So for you guys, what what is Ember and can you tell us a little bit about the history of this project? Uh, I can start probably. Uh, for me, Ember first is the community around it. So it's more like a group of like-minded people who has decided who have decided to. Uh, organized around this uh, one big uh, one big code base and started building cool stuff with that. And historically, Ember is relatively new. It started in late uh, 2011, but uh, the roots of the framework comes from the very very early work of Charles Jolly around m- trying to make his own mail client after Gmail was shipped. So. Uh, the inspiration for the framework came like 10 years ago. And uh, throughout all these years, Sproutco first and then Ember uh, have have changed quite a lot. And uh, today, Ember is not only a framework itself, it's also all the tool sets around it, like Ember CLI and uh, Ember Addons ecosystem. It plays very, very well with uh, other frameworks. There are production deployments of Ember applications using uh, React components inside them. Uh, There there are many, many high-profile companies and projects using Ember, and many of them are open source. For example, Travis CI, if you've seen those green and red badges on GitHub, when you click on them, you see an Ember app. Wine is another popular project the, by Twitter that is using Ember for its web app. Uh, and Apple Music is a new kid in town. Uh, Apple Music UI is done with Ember too. And so it's been in use, and, but from popularity standpoint, because it's a larger framework, uh, it, 
it has uh, some hard time attracting new people because people are scared of the size, of the complexity. But I personally believe that Ember, as an ecosystem as a whole, is much easier to uh, to start with uh, if you compare it to, say, Angular or React. Because once you dive into Ember, you learn the whole package at the same time, and with other frameworks, you learn it bit by bit. But the that means that your learning curve will be extended further. So to be proficient in Ember, you have to spend uh, not not very much time. And to be proficient in other books, you have to spend a lot more. That's just my opinion and why I, I, started, I got interested in Ember initially. Yeah, I think that that's a great, uh, great intro, great, uh, great explanation. I think um, I completely agree. I think the the key the key point for me with Ember is is the community, the people around it. Um, essentially, Ember is about making combined solutions to problems that we all basically have with developing web apps, um, and I think that's the key. Um, as far as the project itself, um, you know, we also try very hard uh, internally to make sure. Uh, you know, to follow Sember, to to not break people's apps, um, and uh, you know, the the run up. We're, we'll be talking a little bit about the run up to 2.0 and what that meant, and what the result of that was, and and whatnot. And we can get into some of the, the specific uh, details. But um, the the goal is clearly to make a very good happy path and make uh, provide escape hatches when you have to do um, non-happy things, um, and um, you know, and make sure we are able to bring all of our users along with us, and not and no one gets sort of left behind on old versions. So, is it like Angular in the sense that you know you have an Angular app or you have an Ember app, and everything is very um, coupled to this convention over configuration type of deal, like where where it's like a lot of 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 overhead, but you get a lot of nice stuff that goes with that. Is that the case? Well, it depends on it depends on uh, the definition of overhead, I guess. Um, so, so yes, there's a ton of conventions, and like if you, I don't know, like use Ember CLI, and if you use the default layout structure, like you can get an app, a d app that you are able to deploy in production like within minutes, like just Ember new, it generates a whole scaffold, p builds out the entire project framework, um, all the build tooling is done, you don't have to touch any of that, and uh, you can go to town directly just writing your app, like your, uh, your bits. Yeah, when people start complaining about the size of the framework, they often forget about the fact that if the size of the, of the, uh, uh, the code that it's, uh, that's in there is the code you don't have to write yourself. Uh, Ryan Florence, a couple of, I think, about a year or two years ago, had a great, great blog post about about framework versus non-framework, and he, he he was talking about the fact that if you start with the smaller, simpler libraries, you tend to b build your own framework over time based on the conventions that you have uh, established in your project. Uh, Ember Ember gives you a lot of that automatically out of the box. And that's why, like, although the start, the start, the initial size might be um, might be larger, as you go on, you add very little code compared to the, what you would do with other products. Okay. And like, if you're using this, uh, you know, is there a good interop story? So, like, like if you want to use like React components as your view layer for Ember, could you do that? I, th I think you can, and uh, the point is that uh, the framework has a lot of escape hatches here and there, especially around the view layer, and that means that, for example, integrating Ember into a Next.js application is possible. I've seen people doing that. Integrating React as a view, uh, uh, React components into Ember applications is also possible. I've seen it, and I believe DigitalOcean has some code that they're running in production that does like this, or something like that. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely possible. Now, the the one thing just to make sure that we're on the same page, one thing you can't do today, um, you can't just replace Ember's baked view layer with like React. Um, that's that's not a thing that we intend to support. It's just not, um, it, it's just not 
uh, on the the sort of happy path spectrum, um, it's it's just going to lead to pain. But you can absolutely like embed um, certain compo- Maybe you need very specific things uh, like a, a specific section where you need um, uh, have ha- need something more like React. You can definitely like just put that uh, make a little Ember component that just um, the React component lives inside, uh, and uh, so that's sort of the bridge to the outside world, um, and uh, it should it should basically work um, pretty well. Yeah, and it's not just the frameworks like the Triple A frameworks. Uh, all the jQuery plugins that you can think of, all the well, like JavaScript, other libraries, say Moment.js or D3, they all work with Ember wonderfully. Yeah, the community seems pretty involved, um, even though it's not necessarily as as loud as some of the other communities out there, which is which is fine. Um, I all the Ember developers I've met actually are pretty smart, so <laughs> like there's a lot of really cool stuff that you guys are doing. Um, I just haven't uh, I haven't experienced that full like uh, I work in, an, in in a place that uses Ember all the time. Um, I can definitely see. Like in Angular, they have um, that component, and I'm just using Angular as an example because that's the one I'm most familiar with. So if you're using like Angular 2, for instance, um, I could see the same idea where you still need some basic bindings, but if you're going to interop, you're going to have to add things on top of that layer. Um, and I may be mistaken, so next time I have Pascal on, he'll probably smack me through the through the uh, hangout. But I think that that's the case uh, as well for these other frameworks. I like um, Aurelia a lot because what Aurelia does is it modularizes everything so that a lot of the things you can piece together um, where if if you're using something in your particular team that's um, really useful to you and you don't want to get rid of that piece, um, it's easy to plug it into Aurelia. Um, I don't think that Aurelia has the support of you know that Ember has or Angular or any of the others, but um, I think it's it's a great idea to have that modularization. So we haven't talked about Ember 2. So is that modularization something that's been part of Ember 2, um, or is it is it still like a, you know a large all or nothing? So as of as of right now, so um, so Ember there's there's two different things. There's Ember 2 the concept and Ember 2.0.0. Um, and, uh, and yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, um, so the when we sat down and wrote the the there was an RFC that uh, that we proposed. Um, Ember follows like an RFC process where, you know, we, we come up with uh, um, proposals or whatever, and they will submit an RFC pull request and and sort of get community feedback on things. Hopefully, early in the process of design um, prior to implementation. Um, anyways, so when we proposed the uh, Road to 2.0 RFC, uh, we had um, a, a grander idea of what we thought we could get done in the time frame we had. Um, you know, a, a, like most developers, uh, I personally am horrible at uh, estimation. So, um, you know, so we had to change some of that around. But we still yeah. plan to progress <laughs> through um, through the 2.0 cycle um, and, uh, and and move towards there. So as of right now, uh, Ember the the emitted output of uh, in, uh, of Ember itself is like a single uh, global. However, during the 2.x cycle, we will be transitioning to um, straight up modules that you just import. Um, and that lets us do things like tree shaking so you only ship to your end uh, clients, uh, browser clients, uh, the portions of Ember that you need, which lets you remove a lot of things that you may not be using in your app. Like most apps probably don't even touch 100% of Ember, right? Um, most of them are probably using uh, a subset. Uh, that's that's you know 50 60 percent you know there's a bunch of like helper methods and uh, nice little macros and things that if you don't use then then why why waste that bandwidth and ship that to the client so th- so that's that's where we're we're going um, there's uh, because of our our process to you know bring along the community make sure everything is in sync make sure there's happy upgrade paths for everything um, some of the stuff takes some time and we we want to make sure that when we roll things out. Um, that it's sort of well arch- architected, so we don't have uh, massive pain later. And you guys' documentation is incredibly thick at this point. Yes, I mean, I was looking at the transition docs from 1.x to 2.0, and they're 
they're rather fabulous, really. I mean, most people don't give you such a thick guide of, of actual documentation. Now, how many developers actually read that documentation, I do not know, because they're developers, and as a developer who sometimes doesn't read the documentation, I can only assume that other developers are also going, huh. But, I mean, have you seen, like, do you, do you find the community loves the documentation? Because I, I love good documentation myself. Oh, yeah. As a person who don't write Ember, like don't develop Ember itself, but uses Ember and helps other people using Ember, the documentation is amazing. It was, uh, I, th I think initially when I, start, when I started poking around, it, was, it wasn't as good, but by the time of 1.0 release, there was a big, big push uh, in documentation, so on documentation side to get it uh, very, 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 very thorough. It's, it's definitely something large, other large frameworks are lacking right now. Yeah, uh, I remember I, w I was about to try Angular 1.0, and the documentation was for 0 0.9, and uh, uh, and because of that, I could I I couldn't start anything. Right. Uh, with Ember today, it's very easy to get started, and maybe like getting started is something that is. Uh, I know that the docs are currently being rewritten by uh, by by the core team, but. Uh, there is a three layer of the documentation. Like you see the home page and you see examples there, and they're really, really great. I once spent 40 minutes just discussing these examples with uh, with the team, and they loved it. And there are guides. Like if you're interested in several topics, certain topics, you can just go through the guide, and it's ex extremely dense. You can find the answer to your question in like just one line. And it would be enough for you to get to get by. And there is a, an API docs, and API docs are also great because sometimes uh, when you hit some certain corner of the framework, inside those API docs, you would get like the whole example how this or that method could be used together with other APIs. Uh, and there are books, there are tons of videos, tons of courses, all sorts of stuff. And uh, because of that. Uh, getting along as you progress on your Ember experience, you get uh, it, your the documentation helps a lot. Yeah, I think um, I, I think you know one of the docs are a thing that I think basically every framework is yelled at about. Um, I, I know that I have heard how horrible the docs are uh, in the past, um, and uh, you know it, it, it's a thing that we can always do better at and get better at. The, the problem that I personally find myself having is that I, um, you know, once you, once you have the, sort of the, the depth of knowledge in a given subject, you basically are disqualified from writing good beginner docs uh, unless you are really, really skilled at figuring out, um, at so understanding true. the beginner perspective. Um, so so I, I often have, have trouble personally with, with that, that sort of uh, beginner doc uh, stuff, um, but but then you know we get into the API docs where you actually do want very detailed specifics on exactly what this thing is going to do, um, and I think um, right now we have a, a documentation sub team that is actively working to rewrite the guides, the tutorial, the intro stuff, the the, the on ramp, if you will, into Ember, uh, and make that uh, even better than it is today. Um, and I think they've they've been doing an excellent job, and uh, and I, I'm definitely grateful for for them stepping up and doing that stuff. Um, and as far as, uh, you know, like internal cross-references and whatnot, you know, we're, we're adding links to the API docs and all that good jazz um, to make sure that, um, um, you know, the you can, you can if you want to jump into the, some depth of knowledge in a given area, you can sort of click this link and, and go there. Um, a lot of that is still being fleshed out. Now, you may not know this. I, maybe you do. But, <clears throat> you know, Tilda, uh, Yehuda Katz's company, um, they they do have they do they control um, Ember's fate like where <laughs> where everything goes or is it totally run by the community because I know sometimes um, in the community typically in open source people will work on what they want right and so there's there has to be some driver like it, is our documents like documentation is that like something that Tilda's been pushing and paying for. Or, or is that something that the community has kind of risen up and said, hey, we really need good docs, let's start working on this? 
Yeah, I think um, I think Tilde is a great company. Um, they they do great work. Uh, Skylight's awesome, but uh, in general, uh, Ember itself is com- very much community run. Uh, all of the core team members are on, as far as I know, on totally different uh, uh, companies, and uh, we sort of we have uh, in person face to faces, and uh, you know we we essentially together determine where what the direction are. Some some of those folks are obviously. Uh, more prominent than than others, um, but uh, but yeah, very much a community run effort. Um, but th- that's not to knock Tilda at all. It just it's just it not like a sort of the, they're not running the show. It, it's very much a collaborative thing. Um, as far as the the docs go, I think the the documentation sub team, as of the last probably two to three months, maybe a little bit longer, um, has really stepped up in, in doing that stuff. We uh, uh, prior to that, the core team tried to um, try to do like not control. That's not the right word, but tried to help and actually do all of the the docs writing and the docs work. Um, and uh, and essentially that, especially during the lead up to 2.0, that led to just not being able to, um, you know, to get it all updated and get it all done. There's just not enough time, not enough hours in the day, that kind of thing. So the the community has definitely stepped up and and done that. Um, I would say the majority of documentation contributions are community contributions, um, and um, you know, l- like for example. Um, we during the ramp up to 2.0, we we felt this pain of new features not being fully documented and things like that that we're trying to push out, and 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 put a full stop on that, and you know made a policy that hey, we're not going to land any new features unless it's fully API docked and uh, have has guides for the beginner level and and all that stuff, uh, where applicable. I mean, obviously some features are only advanced features, but. Um, uh, yeah, so so it's it's very much sort of ingrained in, to make sure that we uh, maintain and keep the keep things going. So how did you guys start talking about like like okay, we want to do Ember two because some of the style of this code is changing. You know, we're going into this ES six world and and like you know what who's who's driving this um, road to Ember? Is it Tom Dale? Is it you Katz? Or or how are you guys deciding it as the community? Well, I mean, I, I think most, many of the things are are driven by different of different different ones of the, the core team, right? So, um, uh, some of the ES6 things, like for example, the uptake of ES6 modules in Ember itself. Um, I think we were one of the largest frameworks to do it early, very early. Um, we, you know, that was very heavily uh, pushed by by Yehuda during his work um, on the actual spec and trying to make sure the spec gets implemented. Having real feedback on those things is very useful. You know, others have been extremely instrumental in uh, pushing, um, you know, testing test helpers or things. You know, all everyone has their own like little niche and. Um, you know, their hot button issue, and, and we sort of collectively put all those in a hat and figure out where things are at. Um, and also, we're all plugged into the sort of developer ecosystem uh, at large and see where things are going and try to sort of read the tea leaves and figure out um, how to best position ourselves as a framework and as a community uh, for the you know the next year or or two years, three years, whatever the time frame is. And. 2.0 was sort of labeled the sort of the garbage collection release of things. I mean, a lot of things sort of got cleaned up uh, in terms of sort of what 1x was uh, sort of into 2. Um, you know, how how was that transition? I mean, you, you, like I look at the sort of deprecation documentation and there were a lot of things. And, you know, you sort of talked, you know, you spoke to the fact that, you know, documentation had to be up to date. You guys are on semantic versioning, but you guys had some churn in there in terms of things that didn't go quite so smoothly. I mean, in, in any big release, it's bound to happen. I mean, what were some of the things that happened that you guys kind of learned from that sort of said, okay, we're, we're, we're going down this magical road to 2.x? Yeah, I think um, I think in general the, the, the one thing that... Uh, that is is obvious in retrospect was that we bit off more than we probably should have initially in like the the broad spectrum of things that we can do, um, and uh, and you know so we we pulled back. There's a series of blog posts on the emberjs.com/blog uh, site where uh, where we sort of talk about what's coming, and then you'll see like this progression. Like wait, uh, that's probably not going to happen. Things like that as we get closer um, to the to the deadline, uh, we 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 made a critical uh, failure and we announced features and a specific date. So um, I, we can pick one or the other, but not both. I think uh, in in my mind now. Um, Who does but, uh, that? 
<laughs> well, apparently we did. Yes, apparently we did. Um, but uh, but you know, so we're learning from that. Um, but as far as the the you know actual sort of breakdown in compatibility and whatnot, um, we take those very seriously. We 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 worked very hard, like through the one thirteen time frame. One thirteen was the uh, 1.13 was the last version prior to 2.0, um, uh, last uh, sort of uh, stable version prior to 2.0. And, uh, you know, 1.13 is actively still receiving patches, still receiving updates, and we are releasing updates as they come to make sure that people's apps are um, able to bridge that gap. Um, if we if we st if we still found something like if we found something today that was removed that we didn't deprecate properly, we will absolutely go back and uh, release an updated 113 version with a with a good deprecation. And, and that's w mostly what I was talking about. Like during 113 uh, 113 1.0 released, and there were things that we were like, oh my goodness, we already have removed this in the next 2.0 branch. Holy crap! We should backport this deprecation and get this out there so people can use it. So, like during the 2.0 development cycle, we were realizing things that we forgot uh, during the deprecation cycle of 1.13. Um, you know, so we had to sort of retroactively backport deprecations, and that's the thing um, that personally I would, uh, you know, I would say is wasn't wasn't the greatest um, at the time. Um, but uh, but I think in the end, like if you were just poking your head up. From version like 112, and now you upgraded to the latest 113. Uh, you are in in a in a great position to continue forward. So I think we've done uh, we've done well, and um, you know, in in our moving forward on um, on on just making that a better process next time. Many of the things we learned, for example, like how uh, all the things we deprecated. You said there was a giant list. Um, you know, much of that uh, giant list um, was like like resulted, for example, in my work app, I had 32,000 deprecations when I went to upgrade to 1.13. Um, that's pretty crazy. And it all it, it was all from like three or four different deprecations that just like got s spammed a bunch of times. You know, so because that seems very painful uh, and those deprecations all go to my console, removing the console as a way to deal with things, um, we, you know, we came up with a nice workflow. So there's a, a nice Ember CLI add-on that lets you manage deprecation warnings and it lets you silence specific ones and work on them one at a time uh, as, you, as you move forward. Um, Ideally, that all that tooling should have been done way before 113 even, um, but we didn't have the pain. We didn't know. Uh, we didn't know what we needed. Um, you know, come 3.0, um, God forbid, whenever that happens, um, we uh, we will be even better uh, fit as a community to sort of move things forward together. Yeah, I would add to that uh, as a person who uses Ember and who sees a lot of Ember applications in the wild. I what I saw what I saw that about ten percent of people had really really hard time updating because they were using some uh, they were extensively using some old APIs that were deprecated. But what Ember community did really really right is announcing the RFC the vision for 2.0, uh, which is not fully uh, realized even today, uh, right? Uh, very, very early on, long before the beta release, long before the final release. So people were getting ready, and people were able to spend their time on uh, transitioning away from, say, FAT controllers, from object controllers, or controllers, to uh, plane controllers, and uh, like switching from use to components and stuff. So if if the team or on any project took time to actually reading that RFC and, and going over the list and trying to uh, align their their code base to this uh, what is coming, they had pretty easy upgrade. I had one person who was uh, very very upset, but used uh, some addons that were like uh, legacy views are done. Uh, because, because uh, to smooth out the upgrade, uh, the Ember core team released two add-ons that were that backported all the features to the new Ember version. And right now, I don't know any any anyone using them. But during the summer period, some people were, were using them with the better versions of Ember 2.0. And the whole transition it haven't happened overnight. It took a while, actually. The whole summer, we had releases of of 2.0 betas and uh, 1.13 updates, 
And that was great because you could stay on 113 and get your way to 2.0. Right now, most of the people I know actually using 2.1 already. Yeah, I know Eric Eric Brin was really busy. He was, you know, touring all over going, you know, doing a doing his rock star thing where he goes in and, and uh, does training for Ember the whole summer. And uh, you know, he finally got a vacation, uh, which just ended, so I follow up with him uh, about that. But it's um it's pretty it's pretty amazing that you guys are able to put so much code in there. I don't know how many commits or releases there were actually were. Um, are you guys at I mean, you, I saw there was a bunch of RCs. Are you guys at full production, like this is 2.0, the real thing? Not only are we past 2.0.0, we are past 2.1.0. Right. So we are now uh, working on the current rate of... So, so Ember follows a six-week release cycle, similar conceptually to Chrome, um, and, uh, and we, we ship um, a, a series of betas, so one beta per week for six weeks, and then we ship that to final. So we've we've gone um, past, we've gotten 2.0, 2.1, uh, and now are on our second or third beta of 2.2. I can't recall off the top of my head, but uh, but yeah. So uh, nice. so onwards and upwards. Um, the the 2.1 and 2.2 cycles didn't really have a ton of new features. So a lot of cleanup, a lot of working on smoothing out uh, rough edges and, and things like that. Um, but I expect 2.3 will have um, a few uh, fairly large features and, and we'll begin sort of that, that new feature development in the 2x cycle again. Now as far as like, like you know, where I work, we use a lot of Angular, right? We use other stuff too, but it's mostly Angular, so most of our in-house people know Angular very well. What problems, like now that 2.0 is this really stable, you know, and what kind of problems does Ember solve that, um, you know, a group such as mine might might consider switching to Ember. Um, what does it What does it do for us? So, I mean, in general, Ember is is solving the all of the um, the internal the, the sort of difficult problems, letting you uh, add and develop the um, you know your actual application concerns and domain stuff. Um, I don't. I'm not an Angular expert, so I'm not going to try to uh, sit and compare the two directly. Um, I do know that uh, for for certain, uh, one of the things that is very important to us is that the framework not get in the way of actually doing the development that you need to do. Um, yeah. And the, you know the build tooling, the um, all of the support, the fact that uh, you know sort of easy distributing of shared code and libraries, all of that has been uh, relatively recent um, sort of improvements in the Ember ecosystem, maybe the last eight months or or so, and uh, and and really make jumping up like if you want a new Ember app and you want uh, to have really smooth transitions, it's like two commands away, and you don't have to do any uh, integration code, you don't have to pull the library in, you just npm install a thing and things just work. Um, I think that is, um, I think that's really where we're hitting our stride and letting uh, app developers leverage community efforts um, and also help those other library maintainers, you know, as you as you pull up and use something like Liquid Fire, which is that uh, trend, the uh, um, animation library I mentioned, um, you know, you might want to add a, uh, contribute some uh, code back uh, and, and that all sort of all sort of feeds itself. All right. And I'm I um I'm a fan of pair programming, right? Because I, I used to do a lot of Ruby coding, and I know that um, some of Ember, you know, some of the roots with Yuha, Yehuda, um, you know, they they come from that Ruby on Rails, um, you know, met methodologies. And I really like the pair programming. And there was most of the JavaScript I saw for pair programming. There wasn't a lot, but um, most of it was Ember, where you you know, like if you go to um, I forget what the app is. It's a Heroku app where you can find out who was looking to pair on certain JavaScript projects. Um, I'll put it in the show notes, but um, it's really interesting. Do you guys find that for if if somebody new is coming on and they're really they're like, well, we use Ember all the time here. We'd love to contribute back. We're having this problem X. Um, I submitted this issue here. Do you guys do like pair programming for something like that? Um, so in general, I um, 
find it relatively difficult to write prose about code, um, about what, like the, the source of a problem, uh, to actually write it out in paragraph form. Um, I oftentimes offer, and very often do, multiple times a week, jump on quick hangouts or screen hero sessions with folks to you know, help them, lead them down the path to fixing the thing, and then they can submit the PR, and I don't have to do all the work. Uh, so yeah, so uh, that absolutely is a thing I personally like to do. I know a number of us do. Um, also, there's a, there's a few uh, consultancies that uh, that are specialized in, in Ember specifically, and and you know they can they come in and help. They do audits, they do performance review, they they can contribute things, and and some some are actually even um, being sponsored to work on the framework internally to add features like uh, like Fastboot, or, which is a server side rendering um, layer, um, and and things like that. So, and some of the initial Glimmer work also. So, you know, so so all of that is um, is is sort of part and parcel, and and it comes with um, just the the really deep community involvement and people willing to jump in and, and just do do work. And with <clears throat> with Ember too, like you talked about Glimmer a little bit. One of the things in in the React uh, community, which they really boast about, is you know their their performance, right? Because they're using the virtual DOM, and they're able to get this um, performance using, for lack of a better term, like ways to get around the DOM, you know, ways to avoid it. Um, I don't want to say DOM hacking, but but basically creating this environment that's just optimized, so it's really fast. And I think Glimmer was kind of the answer to that. Can you talk a little bit about Glimmer and performance in Ember? Yeah, so, so the idea um, uh, behind initially HTML bars, which was like a code name, and, and then ultimately Glimmer, and now coming up the, the Glimmer, like a refactoring, large refactoring is underway right now. Um, but the idea is, is basically to take, um, to take the lessons we've learned from uh, React, for example, um, and, and try to figure out how to leverage them in, in our world, uh, where we have much more, uh, we have like a declarative templates, templating language is not just JavaScript, it's like a template language and handlebars. Um, you know, so, so we try to take those lessons we learned and apply them, apply them here. So for example, things like, um, like what React's doing with uh, DOM diffing uh, in the virtual DOM, uh, we essentially do similar things by having individual, um, uh, we call them morphs, but that doesn't really matter. We have individual objects that manage the actual underlying DOM, and, and they're sort of gatekeepers um, instead of um, instead of trying to figure out, um, you know, oh, what changed in the DOM tree? Just at every level, each thing remembers its last value and just does a, a quick, hey, is this updated? If not, then um, you know, then then set set content or or whatever the the um, actual behavior is depending on what kind of thing it is, if it's an attribute or if it's a um, text note or something like that. But um, you know, I think um, I think the, the the goal absolutely is to um, pick up uh, one of the things Ember 1.0 was not great at was uh, some performance related things with large lists and also like re-rendering large lists, like if you sort it or something like that. Um, you know, in, in Ember 1.13 and then continuing on to the 2x cycle, um, we really tried to nail. Um, that that sort of re-rendering large list uh, scenario very well, um, and I think we did a a really good job. Um, and uh, now we're still actively working on uh, a, a few other aspects. For example, the um, the initial renderings um, uh, time for a first render isn't quite what we want it to be. So we're actively pushing forward and uh, doing some refactorings and doing some work there. Um, but, um, you know, yeah, so so absolutely, we try to sort of poke our heads up, figure out what, what things other people are doing to work around these same, we all have the same DOM slowness problems, right? So uh, figuring out how to, uh, how to move forward and, and get that, um, get that same uh, speed gain in Ember without changing the fundamental programming model, I think is very, uh, has been a very uh, important concern. Yeah, and it's actually exciting to see the F team now talking about uh, getting the ideas that were implemented in Glimmer Gl and bringing them back to React. So uh, as Ember gets faster, React will get faster too, and if some framework would come up, or some library, uh, would come up with some even even better ideas how to improve performance, I think every, every big framework would eventually end up using those ideas. Just like browsers themselves, they use 
the ideas about how to make JavaScript or rendering faster. Uh, initially, like four or five years ago, all these browsers had different virtual machines, and right now they steal all the techniques from each other, and we get faster and faster JavaScript every day. Yeah, and Ember, I know JavaScript. A lot of people think is the bottleneck on mobile, but <clears throat> I really don't. I, I don't think so, to be honest. Uh, how is it with with Ember on on mobile? Because I know, like with Angular, typically you'll 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 make an Angular app, it'll work on mobile. But if you want really that native performance, you'll probably use something like Ionic or you know um, a, a combination of you know Cordova and some plugins to make a native app versus like having that you know an app that's mobile first always on the browser so what's the what's the story with the browser support for mobile on on uh, Ember? Uh, so there is a large open source project called Discourse it's mm -hmm. an online forum software and they decided to use Ember for their front end and they did a lot of work about around optimizing the Ember rendering and uh, like the speed of Ember on Android and iOS initially, and a lot of performance-related uh, fixes and improvements were coming from that team, say two or like uh, one year, uh, one year ago. Uh, but uh, recently, Jeff Atwood, uh, the uh, the founder of Discourse, wrote a post uh, that was relatively popular. Uh, saying about like the performance of Android, and he was using this course as an, ex as an example, uh, saying that Android is uh, Android browsers render things much much slower than they do on iOS, and execute JavaScript much slower than uh, on iOS. And uh, on one hand, we got bad publicity from that; people start talking about like Android being slow on mobile. On another hand, this publicity actually kicked off some work internally on Chromium and V8 teams about optimizing uh, the, the the code that uh, Ember actually emits, right? And it turned out that Angular 2 also has similar problems on, on mobile. And the work that Chrome team and V8 team uh, V8 team are doing right now will actually benefit both libraries. Uh, at the same time, Ember doesn't have anything specific well, right, uh, to like desktop only or mobile only. Uh, when you when you have Ember on your team, uh, on your on your, I mean on the page, you would get uh, Ember would uh, handle all the events, not only like mouse events and keyboard events, but also touch events as well. So uh, it works with uh, Cordova with uh, PhoneGap uh, out of the box and. Uh, if you're diligent, uh, if you're careful in uh, form, you can get very, very good performance of Ember apps on mobile. And some people actually use it on mobile uh, with, uh, without actually feeding the performance bottlenecks that this course had. So uh, it's, uh, there is no, uh, no such thing similar to React Native for Ember at the moment. And I don't think the, there are active, uh, active projects doing that. Uh, our active teams are doing stuff around this, but it's interesting to see how, how it goes well. well. I personally believe that uh, the web performance can be very, very close to native performance, and uh, we probably wouldn't need uh, doing uh, stuff like we have in the future. Yeah, I can agree. I mean, it's not the JavaScript that's the problem. It's you know, like you know, sometimes it's the it's it's mostly DOM, right? And it's mostly like the interaction of animation and um, in, in the DOM. And if you use native transitions versus you know DOM transitions, is totally different world. And not every client is you know, hey, I want a native app. You know, I just want a website that if I go on my iPhone, I can see the website and it looks fine. And then when I go to desktop, it looks good and tablet and it's fine. And um, you know that mobile first approach if you do something like ionic or Cordova in general uh, phone gap or what have you uh, you get to share that web view component of that versus using something like um, react native where you you're using JavaScript to interface with that API I, I would think that you could share more code with the web view than you would be able to with that native but it would depend I guess on you know your clients needs 
Yeah, and it's still very common to use uh, for just to use Cordova as an example to to use Cordova for like 95% of your app, and then you might want, or I'm sorry, use Ember for 95% of your Cordova app, and then dropping down and doing some Objective C or um, whatever Java, I guess, um, for Android. Um, you know, just to get like I don't know, like integration with like a camera or um, things like that. Like so, that's that's absolutely um, a, a fairly common a common thing. Um, and there's nothing stopping that from happening. It's actually very straightforward to do that integration. Um, and there's there's uh, there's a number of uh, add-ons in the Ember uh, ecosystem that make um, testing and building those kinds of apps uh, very straightforward. Um, and this also includes things like Electron or NWGS, which aren't really mobile related, but they are still sort of targeting an alternate platform. Yeah. And how about, um, you know, for, for Ally, for accessibility? So, I mean, I think, when I think of Ember, because of its use on discourse and everything, I think of, you know, pretty high accessibility. I think that a lot of the components would be built with that in mind. Is that the case? Yeah, I think uh, by, out of the box, uh, by default, um, Ember um, has all the sort of normal support that you would expect. Um, the When you develop an app, you definitely have to continue to think about what you're doing and, and how you're doing it. Um, you know, like the, the, the specific things that you're doing are, are fairly important. Um, you know, so the app developer is ultimately the sort of end-all, be-all to make a, an accessible site and how you design your, your DOM, your HTML, uh, markup and and all that good jazz, um, but but from a framework perspective, um, we we expose all of the all the right sort of knobs and buttons and and all the things, um, and are actively trying to push forward. Um, like as I mentioned before, like we have a community driven RFC process, and uh, one of the RFCs is to try to figure out how to make um, the sort of transition in a single page app from one area to another um, more um, accessible uh, to like screen readers for example you know many single page apps um, fall into the trap when you route from one internal page to another one um, to uh, essentially that dynamic transition is is invisible to a screen reader they're not aware that that transition happened um, you know so so we're doing trying to do a lot of work there um, and uh, and just make things better um, not just for Ember but at, on the web period um, and I think I think all of the frameworks are, are essentially going to be um, working towards that same goal. Yeah, and that's been a challenge for us too, even with with Angular and with other frameworks, is getting that accessibility for single page apps. Like um, a lot of our applications are built with other third parties that will use server routing. So now I'm looking at other you know things like having universal JavaScript or isomorphic JavaScript, whatever it's called these days. But um, you know, so you get that rendering on the server in the client. Um, but with the single page app too, I've been experimenting with ARIA Live and different ways to determine dynamic content using ARIA, but it is very challenging for sure. Um, well, in, in, I am far from an expert um, in accessibility in general. Um, I know that there are many experts that do work on, on these problems. Um, but, um, you know, I don't think it's really um, like a specific, like there's no golden gun. There's no uh, very specific uh, solution, and I think that's part of the problem. I think as uh, web developers, period, not Ember, not React, not Angular, or Earlier, uh, we need to come together and we need to find a solution to this problem and, um, and, and sort of solve it so that all end users, every person ever that has to either use a screen reader or develop for one doesn't have to like make their own hacky solution. I think as developers, we're all pretty curious and logical and we want to solve problems, right? We want to fix stuff. We want to build stuff. So it's like if, if we did have that gun that was perfect, that okay, every time I'm going to use this, I think a lot of us would get bored with, with development. <laughs> I, would just shoot myself, I would just shoot myself in the foot. Like, I feel like <laughs> I feel like you give me some mystical thing that's going to resolve, you know, you do this and it resolves all your problems and then it does, I mess it up. But maybe that's just me. I like breaking things. Um, uh, but it is a hard problem, right? I mean, there is a reason that it hasn't sort of been solved. I mean, there are lots of people working on it to sort of make it better. I think it's gotten way better across the board, I think, overall for the web, uh, both from a mobile standpoint and a, and a desktop standpoint. I mean, there is a lot more uh, work that has been done recently than years past where it was sort of a second, you know, it was an afterthought. You know, oh, I'll tack it on as opposed to, wow, I really do need this. Um, uh, so I think, that's, I think that's a positive that's come out of 
a lot of things. Yeah, yeah also, I mean, there's even places that place. just they do they do desktop first, right? Well, yeah. mobile is not even a consideration in some places. Yeah. Also, speaking of accessibility, uh, it's also a matter of educating developers. Some people don't even heard about the term. Uh, they don't know how to start working on accessibility. People haven't seen, say, VoiceOver on Mac or something like that. They haven't tried screen readers themselves. They haven't tr uh, seen people using screen readers. And uh, because of that, it's hard to even start talking about that. But recently, uh, like, uh, uh, like Justin said, uh, it's more a matter of automating, right, and getting a lot of that being automated. And recently, there, were, there is a big push into making tools for accessibility, for accessibility work. Not just making like components that are accessible themselves, but giving application developers tools to, uh, to help them identify where they lack in terms of accessibility. Right? Uh, Ryan Florence uh, released React Accessibility uh, A11i uh, plugin. That was great. It would uh, just uh, run over your page and check elements for missing area or uh, uh, artifacts and give you very, very clean error messages saying like how you can do better in terms of accessibility. So it was an easy step similar to what uh, Ember is doing with deprecation workflows. And since then, uh, we have uh, the... the uh, other plugins merged for other frameworks. There is one for Ember, which is, you can Google it, like Ember Accessibility something to something, and I believe there should be one for Angular 2, so uh, it should be easier today than it was, say, even two years ago. And, and tooling really does set frameworks apart from other frameworks, too. I mean, I think, you know, everyone talks about, you know, latest, greatest framework X, because it seems like there's a new JavaScript framework or you know framework of choice for your platform that comes out every week, mm -hmm. and then we discuss them for some reason because we we need something to talk about apparently in the web development community. Uh, you know, yeah, this shi it's so shiny. Look at the shiny thing. Like, oh, yeah. I must. Walk you can always learn this. something from from those new ones though, because they obviously built it because they had a problem. Sure, but but uh, but at the same point, you look, you, you take something like Ember, right? Like Ember Inspector, like that's a tool that sets it apart from other things. Like I, and I think that tooling is sort of key to like the maintainability and the continued growth of any particular thing, because it's it, it to some extent it's easy to have an opinion and it's easy to to apply that opinion in code to solve the thing the problem that you have. It's another thing to grow a community around an open source project that continues to go. Uh, that continues to have tools that take into, a, into account. This was deprecated. I have legacy support through version X. Uh, here's the tooling required to do, uh, uh, you know, accessibility checking. Like, that's an important sort of thing. Like, I, I think that in the shininess of new things, we sometimes lose track or we lose sight of, oh, well, I do have to reinvent a whole bunch of things to actually make this other thing work in my workflow. Um, which is not to say that the other things are bad. Everyone starts somewhere, right? But mm -hmm. at the same time, it's nice to have solid rocks of which to stand. <laughs> no, I, I think my point is not that we should use all of these frameworks, but that some of the ideas that are spawned in them are are interesting and can be used in the larger frameworks. You know, totally. so it's something we shouldn't just ignore them. I think. And the tooling, as far as that goes, uh, from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I think the CLI tools and stuff, that was all community-driven, right? That wasn't something that Ember said, hey, we're going to do this, right? I think that was community-driven first, and then it was put into the Ember umbrella. Well, uh, so, so initially... Uh, Ember has always had very specific conventions, right? So, but initially those conventions didn't really apply to project structure, physical structure. Um, I mean, I guess if you use like Ember Rails, which probably a lot of people did, um, you, you would have that prescribed structure. But, uh, but you know, there were still a ton of apps that were developed um, outside of, of that ecosystem that didn't have that same understanding of, of convention um, at the like sort of file directory level and the building output and all that kind of stuff. And I think um, so Ember CLI was sort of born out of like being very tired of redoing all of this build stuff every time on every new project. It's very very annoying, um, you know. So uh, so yes, yeah, so that started out under 
uh, under Stefan Penner's um, GitHub account, and then we uh, sort of iterated for quite a while, um, and uh, and then migrated it to its own top-level sort of Ember CLI org. Um, now there's a bunch of sub-projects and, and whatnot. Um, but but I think that <clears throat> the story is, is absolutely uh, critical to the point of what makes Ember great, and that story is uh, some developers had pain. We got together as a community to try to make that pain better and make sure that other people don't have the same pain. And, and I think by and large, um, we, um, we, we've, we've done that. Um, we have a lot of room to grow. But, uh, but I think that that's, that's the key, and that's the thing. Uh, and because of, of solving that problem, now you can grab any off-the-shelf uh, component and, um, you know, and, and plug it in and use it in your app uh, basically for free. Um, before that, you have to do a lot of the wiring and glue yourself. Like, you have to do your custom gulp build or your custom grunt build and, like, embed this vendor file in this order and concatenate them and figure out how to do all that stuff. And now all that is just done. You don't have to worry about that. Um, I think that's, that's awesome. And you guys got it done, too, which is, you know, this happens a lot in, in open source where you'll see, like, an issue filed, and then, you know, you look at the date when it was put out. It's, like, two years old, and people haven't cleaned it up or worked on it, and you're like, oh, my gosh, is this ever going to be in here? But you guys felt that pain, and you, you took care of it as a community, which is pretty awesome. I love that. So is there anything that um, is really core to understanding Ember 2? Like, how do people get started with it? You know, and and um, how can they contribute once they're comfortable with it? But I think more importantly, how do people get started with Ember if they have no understanding of, you know, how this works? Um, so the uh, the Ember, uh, guides.emberjs.com uh, has some uh, very specific sort of high level. Uh, here's what templates look like. Here's what components look like. Um, stuff. We're actively working on more like a get started from scratch. You have nothing uh, and no prior knowledge uh, sort of guide. Um, that's still uh, in the works. Um, there's a bunch of, of books that exist out there. I can um, link them in the uh, the show docs. Um, and um, but there's there's a couple of books out there that that are set up to help people sort of onboard, make their own first app, that kind of thing, um, and a whole slew of of articles. Uh, we also have a really active Slack community. Um, with uh, you know a few thousand people and um, it's it's great to see people just helping. Um, there's like a need help channel and there's always people helping other people and um, you know so so you definitely if you're going to learn Ember you should definitely jump in to that Slack channel and uh, uh, just absorb knowledge, ask questions, um, get feedback. Yeah, the Slack channel for Polymer I know is really really awesome where you get a lot of information. It's like you know Stack Overflow but live, right? So. I'm sure. I'm sure with thousands of people, it's like that with Ember too. Yeah, exactly. Oh. It's exactly the same. It's 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 really really great. Uh, now, Stack Overflow is still an awesome tool. Oftentimes, I'll I'll help people in Slack and I'll say, Hey, wait, would you mind making a Stack Overflow for this? And then we can just put the answer in, just because it's yeah. easier for long term searching. Um, Slack is is a great tool to use, but the history limits um, make it difficult to like like his, like go back to something that was answered you know a couple of days ago and, and find it just because of the quick drop off of uh, messages. So you know so it's still nice to have those question and answers online like for posterity for searching and, and whatnot. Um, but I think um, I think the ability to just like get live help, whether it be Slack or IRC or whatever, I think that is a huge selling point to uh, to any framework. Now, if people are looking through the code and they want to contribute, you know, do you recommend, like, a certain area of the code? Or, like, if, if you know, is there to-dos in the, in the you know, comments? Or is there, like, um, issues to follow? Or should, if people find something that is a bug that they've verified, they can do a PR? Like, what is the recommendation with, with um, the project? So there's there's um, so mostly um, there's a number of issues uh, that we try to sort of tag label with good for new contributors uh, where um, it may or may not be uh, easy but at least it's like the path is laid out right um, uh, it's not just like fixing typos it's you know actual involved things so that's that's there uh, also as you're learning uh, the, I love it when people that are learning Ember go in and update the docs because that you know like I said before it's hard to get that beginner perspective and know where things are uh, sort of dropping off and, and being missed um, you know so that's that's awesome I think that's that's probably the single best place to contribute as a, as a newcomer to the framework or to you know single page apps in general just like helping with those docs but then as you progress through that process you you begin 
um, developing uh, apps, and then you'll have pain points, and you'll have bugs, or hopefully not bugs, but you might, uh, and uh, and then you know contributing back and helping those. There's a specific Slack channel uh, dedicated to development of Ember itself, and uh, people jump in there and say, hey, what can I do, or how do I do this thing, and and we'll help them sort of groom uh, a PR forward um, and uh, and make things happen. Yeah, I would also add that there are tons of other add-ons, uh, third-party libraries, uh, uh, some uh, things like Ember CLI or, say, Liquid Fire or something like that, or Ember Data, uh, that also needs attention. And if a person works with uh, some of the, these add-ons and knows the inner workings really, really well, then he or she may be very, very helpful to the community. What I love about the community is that instead of, like, trying to com out-compete each other, People tend to uh, to search for common points, common grounds. For example, there is a big add-on called Ember CLI Deploy, and it's an add-on that helps deploy your applications to, say, S3 or like Azure or other clouds, right? And it started as a merge. Uh, uh, it started from the talk by Luke Milia. Uh, at RailsConf about how how his company is doing deploys, and a couple of people started implementing that openly in the wild. And at a certain point, they decided to just merge their efforts. And instead of like having three add-ons that do some small things right and some other things wrong, we have one big add-on ecosystem that itself has some pluggable architecture and stuff. But from the day one, this add-on had a big community, like six core contributors. It's super, it's super great. Yeah, I mean, it's great when you have a project like that. You know, like I know the Node community is very much like that, and um, the Web Components community as well. Um, as far as, I know we, we're, we're up against time, but I did want to ask a quick question about um, Ember components and interop with, you know, like um, Web Components in general. So, uh, Are we arguing is... about Shadow Dom now? I, I feel like we're about no to No more argue. Shadow Dom. <laughs> I'm going to hide in a corner, no. okay? You guys have fun. <laughs> document fragments. <laughs> That's fine. I'm sorry. <laughs> we had enough of that last week. <laughs> um, we can have a separate hangout, you and me. <laughs> but um, sure, I just want to sure. know, kind of, what's, what's the long pl long-term plan for these, and, and how does it work with, you know, Ember components? Because Ember components, they have this, you know, um, from what I understand, there's there's like data bindings and all this all those all other stuff that um, you know maybe web components they can do, but it's not necessarily what they do. Like with a web component, it's its API is its interface, like its attributes, its properties, and its events. So there's no like you know binding by default unless you're using something like Polymer or whatever. Uh, yeah, so I think um, I, I think there's there's a couple of things. Um, Ember components were originally thought of as um, sort of following the web component spec. Um, however, that was many years ago, and those things have changed like three or four times since then. Um, you know, so so uh, as far as as far as uh, the way the intersection between Ember components and web component, I think is still uh, in flux. Um, there's active work being done on. Um, on Glimmer, um, uh, Glimmer refactorings and whatnot. Um, part of the 2.x cycle intends to introduce um, what we're calling angle bracket components or Glimmer components, uh, which are essentially not using you know the curly curly syntax of handlebars, but using uh, what looks like web component syntax uh, for invocation. Um, you know, and, and <clears throat> again, th at that point, your API is the exposed attributes and the functions you pass and that kind of stuff, um, with still the added benefits of live binding and, and whatnot that, that you get with Ember by default. I'm not terribly sure how useful a non-live bound sort of thing uh, would be in a single page app uh, off, off the bat like essentially you see you see those those basically being emulated in uh, other web component implementations um, you know so so I we need to figure that out also in ember uh, one critical piece that uh, I don't know how it fits in with the web component spec uh, yet is uh, the way we yield block parameters so the calling context can yield down um, um, you know, block parameters in our case to uh, you know to the the inside 
block, and uh, and that's not really a thing that's really addressed, to my knowledge, in the uh, web component spec. Um, you know, so we definitely need to figure that out. It, it solves a lot of problems in Ember, uh, and like in actual use, it's very very useful and important. Um, you know, to be able to do that. I wonder if you could use something like generators for that, because then you have that cancelability, but you also have that like where, you know, you could pause, and then when the next thing happens, you could get you get that control. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely possible to do. What I just think, as a spec in general, it needs to be uh, either addressed or, like I said, no, this is not a thing. <laughs> right. Okay. So pretty much, you would wrap it in in a number component as of now, but the future is sort of, you know, um, debatable. Yeah, I mean, ideally, so Ember is is generally about embracing standards and, and following behind them, um, and hopefully trying to make them better as we go. So I, I think uh, I know that uh, there's a few different people that are involved in Ember uh, heavily that are also involved in the Web Component Spec and in dealing with that stuff. And I know that we're sort of keeping an eye on on the path forward for future as these things sort of solidify and in various browser implementations exist or uh, come come out. Um, you know, one of the issues. That, that we have to figure out is obviously we still need to support um, uh, Ember 2.0 supports back to IE9, um, and uh, and so so that's a, a fairly important factor as well in, in what we can and can't do, uh, how far back we have to support. Yeah, Did I wonder how long eight, that'll last yeah. because in January IE8 and 9 and 10 are all being dropped by Microsoft as far as support goes, so no more security patches and all that. Yeah, I mean we're we're pretty much locked in uh, for the 2x cycle to supporting IE9 plus. Um, our the the big thing for us prior to that in the 1x cycle we were using we were supporting IE8 and uh, you know we um, we I'm sure that there are still some uh, relatively decent sized enterprise folks that need IE8 support for the time being until the security support is dropped from Microsoft. Um, but uh, you know so they may be sticking at 113. But uh, it was very important to us to be able to like just use ES5. Um, and um, and that's just not possible in IE8. Uh, we can do so many things in uh, in Ember today and in uh, and Glimmer and in supporting libraries now that we can depend on ES5 being a thing. Um, that uh, that it, it was way way worth it. Yes, and I hope the internet sent you guys a cake for dropping IE8 support. I can only hope that 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 was what the internet did. If you haven't done that internet, please do that. <laughs> I uh, I did I did eat a cake, <laughs> but uh, no one sent it to me. Uh, but I didn't get any e like nasty uh, emails either. So that's that's positive. That's about that's like internet giving you a cake, not getting uh, nasty mail, right? This is true. Uh, the internet is mm. generally good at that when it comes to those things. Uh, <laughs> I think Yehuda and Tom received cake from my team when they it's one point zero. Uh, I, rem I remember pictures of cake. Yeah, there's definitely there was an ember cake at 1.0. Yes, for sure. I don't I don't remember where it came from. I didn't get to eat any cake, but I was just yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> they should do like some giant ember, you know, mascot cake, and you guys just eat that. <laughs> yep. Future note for the next ember conf: uh, ember cake. Ember cake. Yes. Forget the ice sculpture. Just do the cake. All right, um, so I think I think we're over time, so I appreciate you guys staying on a little bit longer. Um, if people want to contact you guys, what's your what's your Twitter handles? How can people find you? Um, I think it's great that you're doing Hangouts and some pairing, um, so I might I might uh, take advantage of that and and play a little with Ember because I always love to learn new stuff. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm RWJ Blue basically everywhere Twitter, GitHub, uh, Slack, um, all that stuff. Um, you can uh, ping me on Twitter or um, just uh, jump in the Slack channel and uh, chat. Um, uh, I'm generally available all the time, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, but also good. So um, so yeah, so I love I love um, helping people with uh, with issues and and uh, figuring out where we can make the framework better and where things fall down. Careful by giving out your availability. Remember, you have contributors all over the world. <laughs> That's the beauty of open source. I, I can just like go to sleep. I can go uh, go play some video games if I have to. 4 a.m. Robert, where are you? I need help with this. You said you were online. <laughs> I saw you on Slack. 
you should help me. Right. Uh, I'm Andrei Listochkin. I'm Listochkin at Twitter, GitHub, Slack, and also we have a very, very active Russian-speaking chat for Ember developers. If you speak Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, or some other similar languages, come join by. We it's a lovely place. We help newcomers, and those newcomers after a while start start helping as well. So right now we have this chain of people of different uh, skill uh, skill sets, and it's the friendliest place uh, I've seen on the internet. So uh, if you if you don't speak our languages, uh, you should definitely go to Slack and use English there, uh, and you can also find me there too. Can we get that in the uh, in the show notes? The Slack of course, link. I'll send it back. And uh, do you have any meetups by you guys? Oh yeah. That, uh, uh, that uh, we don't do like Ember specific meetups, but Ember topics are always on our, on on board when we have local conferences and events. And Ukraine is a very very active uh, place, uh, development wise. Uh, and we have events in every major city, in every major city every month about JavaScript. And there will be talks uh, about Ember on the upcoming JavaScript conference uh, in Kharkiv and other places. So if you are close by, just drop by. You don't most likely you don't need a visa to go to Ukraine. So and it's a safe place. Now. Okay, let's get some notes for those. And if if you got some too, Robert. We'll put them in. Yeah, definitely. There's a bunch of Ember meetups. We have a nice site dedicated to sort of listing all of the different Ember meetups cities, and um, a lot of them are on like meetup.com or something, so you can go and check out their times and whatnot. Yeah, I think it's so important to get that face to face. Um, you know, every once in a while. I know I'm pr- I'm kind of an introvert, so I'm usually on a podcast or something virtual, but it is it is nice every once in a while to get out and meet de- developers locally. Um, and that's how I met some of the Ember developers here. Like we have um, a really talented developer, um, David Bashford. He he runs um, the Mimosa project. I don't know if you guys are familiar with. Mm-hmm. He's he's pretty active on GitHub, but um, but Mimosa is his his baby on open source. But he does a lot of Node development at his company Berico, and um, you know a lot of the developers he works with for the front end. It's pretty much all Ember. So. And that's that's kind of like uh, that's like my go-to if I have questions for Ember for local people. I'm like David, can you answer this for me? <laughs> so um, yeah, it's really nice to get out and meet people locally and see what people are doing. All right, so I think that's it. Um, so if you guys have questions about Ember, uh, definitely contact um, our guests here. And if you want to contribute or help out or use use it, and learn about it. Maybe you're not sure. Um, you know, if you want to use it, um, but you definitely want to play with it, try some of those tutorials, uh, follow some blogs, and we'll put as much as we can in the uh, resources section of our notes uh, for everybody. So thanks. This has been episode number 68, Ember 2, and the Ember community. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Call for Proposals is done and registration is open, and O'Reilly Fluent Comp is back in just a few months. Fluent, the web platform conference, will be held in San Francisco, California on March 7th through 10th, 2016. So get practical training in JavaScript, HTML5, CSS, and the latest web development technologies and frameworks. The Web Platform Podcast listeners receive a 20% discount when registering for the conference. So make sure you use the promotional code PCW. PP20 to receive your discount. You want to learn more about what's coming on next on the Web Platform Podcast? Follow us on Twitter at, at the Web Platform or on Google Plus and YouTube at Plus the Web Platform. We also need your help in creating transcripts of the episodes and helping to create open source projects under our GitHub organization. Contact Eric Isaacson at E Isaacson or Danny Blue at D underscore Blue. That's D-E-E underscore B-L-O-O. Thank you for listening, everybody, and we'll catch you all next week.